Thanks very much, Brother James, and good evening, brethren and sisters, and young people. Well, some of you might be thinking, what has this subject tonight got to do with the theme that has been the basis of our studies thus far, that is, the redemption of Israel? Well, it has a lot to do with it, we're going to see, because we're going to have a look at the history of the times of Ahab and Jezebel, and particularly, of course, Omri, his father, of whom we've just read, and see how this is the basis of much that we find in the Apocalypse. We'll see that the roots of the Apocalypse are back here in this record of 1 Kings 16 and 17. Now, all of us, of course, are quite familiar with Elijah the prophet. We read that record of verse 1 of chapter 17. And Elijah the Tishbite bursts onto the scene like a bolt of lightning out of Gilead. And he blasts the idolatry of Ahab and Jezebel. And he says... That there will not be dew nor rain these years. But according to my word, and the rest is history, there was a drought for three and a half years, as we know. I just want you to tuck that one away. Elijah's period of ministry, so to speak, was three and a half years. Shortly after that, of course, he disappears. He goes to Horeb, finally back to Gilead, we believe eventually whipped away by the power of the Spirit. And that was the, basically the end of his ministry. So the three and a half years is a very important part of the life and work of Elijah. A work that is incomplete. And he has to come back to complete that work and we are going to be there hopefully to help him. And that's what this historical record is really all about. It's actually prophecy as we're going to see. So we're familiar with Elijah. We may not but he quite as familiar with the fact that there were two Babylonian apostasies in the history of God's people Israel, both northern and southern kingdom. There is, of course, the, the apostasy of Manasseh in the south, who spent 50 odd years bringing the Babylonian idolatry into the ecclesia and utterly undermining it and ultimately destroying it. It was for his apostasy, of course, that they went into captivity in 587 BC. But Manasseh's Babylonian apostasy was preceded by one in the north. And that was the apostasy of Ahab and Jezebel. It was Babylonian too, as we're going to see this evening. And you know, of course, that there is a prophecy in Zechariah chapter 5, which has been considered here recently in this ecclesia. You know that Zechariah chapter 5 is about the development of a Babylonian apostasy out of the Ecclesia. You know that that was fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ said in Revelation chapter 2 that that Ecclesia at Thyatira suffered that woman Jezebel. And so there were the beginnings of a Babylonian apostasy in the Brotherhood. That's what Zechariah 5 is all about. And these two women, of course, in Zechariah chapter 5, were none other than Jerusalem and Samaria. Very appropriate, because there were, were two Babylonian apostasies, one in the north, based in Samaria, which, by the way, Omri built, and one in the south, in Jerusalem. When you come to Zechariah 5, and we're not going to go there and talk about it because it's fairly well known here, you see, this night vision, the sixth night vision, which is very appropriate, isn't it? the sixth night vision well that is the number of man and the apostasy that developed according to this prophecy brought about the existence of a man whose number is six 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 he came out of the brotherhood we should never ever forget that fact the catholic church that system as we know it came from us brothers and sisters and if it could happen in past centuries, it can happen in the present. It was allowed to happen because they suffered that woman Jezebel and she grew and developed into a multitude who overturned the truth in those second and third centuries after Christ. How did that happen? Well, it happened because the symbology that is used is of an ephah. And an ephah was used in commercial transactions. And it was... Judaism's commercialised religion that they brought back with them from Babylon that was the key 
to the development of that Catholic apostasy out of the Brotherhood. You know, this was the mechanical, commercialised religion with the bank balance, with the two sides to the ledger that, that the apostles had to fight against, that Paul spent his whole life contending against and writing epistle after epistle about Judaism. Why would he spend the time? Because he knew where it was going. And it did go that way. Ultimately, it developed the Catholic Church out of the Ecclesia. So this is a prophecy, isn't it, Zechariah 5, of that very fact. So when we, when we look at what happened back in the days of Ahab and Jezebel, we have the roots of what we see extant today and which, if we maintain the faith, we are going to be privileged to participate in destroying. That's what is in front of us, if we maintain the faith. So I want to come back now and have a look at the roots of this system that developed in Israel in the times of Omri and Ahab. Let's come to that reading which we had this evening from 1 Kings chapter 16. Now this fellow Omri, we probably tend to put in the unimportant category amongst the kings. That is a mistake. That is a serious mistake. He was a very powerful man. We must see that the scripture uses a formula. It's the formula of Micah chapter 6 and verse 16. You know what that says? I haven't got time to take you there. I know by history that I can't afford to do that. Otherwise I'll still be here an hour and a half in an hour and a half's time. So we can't do that. But I will read it out to you from my brain. It says this, Micah chapter 6, verse 16. For the statutes of Omri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab. And that's a formula which is historical. That comes from Cush and Nimrod, as we're going to see. Cush, the great original prophet of the Babylonian mysteries, was the father of Nimrod, who was the one who put into practice the principles his father had taught him. That formula is followed from Omri and Ahab. The statutes of Omri are kept. What does that mean to you? Well, it means he was a statute maker. He developed a statement of faith. He developed things that then became the basis upon which Ahab ruled. The statutes of Omri are kept and all the works of the house of Ahab. <clears throat> so he was a very powerful man. He bought the hill from Shema and he built the city of Samaria. He was the one that established the foundations of Ahab's kingdom. And of course, Ahab proved himself to be even worse than his father and therefore the worst of all the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel. And the reason that he was the worst is that he went and married Jezebel and brought her into the ecclesia of God. And she brought Baal worship. And Baal worship has its origins, as we're going to see tonight, with Cush and Nimrod. That's where it came from. So immediately you begin to see why God uses this kind of formula in Micah chapter 6 and verse 16. Ahab was the implementer of the ideologies of Omri. Ahab was the builder of Canaanite worship which came from Nimrod. And so the record of 1 Kings 16 verse 31 says this, And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. Now Jezebel has one of the most outstanding misnomers in the Bible. Her name means chaste, not C-H-A-S-E-D, <coughs> but C-H-A-S-T-E, chaste as in pure, like a virgin. Is pure. Well, isn't that a misnomer for this harlot woman who had at least 400 boyfriends in addition to her husband, at least that, and followed the practices that she learned from a woman called Semiramis. And we're going to talk a bit about Semiramis tonight as well. She was the first mother of harlots in history. Just happened to be the wife of Nimrod. We're going to see what part she plays in this record of the prophecy that, is, that lies here in the times of Ahab and Jezebel. If we wondered why 
verse 34 is in 1 Kings chapter 16. Verse 34 says this, In his days did Hiel the Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abiram his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his younger son Segub, according to the word of Yahweh which he spake by Joshua the son of Nun. Why does this verse find its place here in the times of Ahab and Jezebel? Ever asked yourself that question? And says God just sort of decided, well, this would be a good place to pop it in. You know, and I'll put it in here. And when they do their readings, I come across it and say, oh, well, God just popped it in there. He didn't just pop it in there. He had to put it in there. You know why? Because Ahab was the man who brought Baal worship back into the ecclesia of God. And Baal worship was enshrined in Jericho. And God devoted it to utter destruction. That's why it was devoted to utter destruction. And Joshua made a prophecy about this, didn't he? Joshua chapter 6 and verse 26. You might just want to have that open because we're going to make a bit of a comparison here. Joshua chapter 6 verse 26, we read this. But after the destruction of Jericho, the record tells us in verse 26, and Joshua adjured them at that time. So this is a serious business. Cursed be the man before Yahweh that riseth up and buildeth this city Jericho. He shall lay the foundation thereof in his firstborn, and in his younger son shall he set up the gates of it. Now that is the prophecy, and it's fulfilled in the times of Ahab and Jezebel. So Ahab's gone up to the king of the Zidonians. He's got a wife from Ephbaal. Ephbaal means with or near Baal. And Jezebel never left Baal in all of her life. She brought Baal worship from the land of Sidon down into the land of Israel. And she cultivated it assiduously all of her days until horses trampled her to death in Jezreel. Okay, so she was a woman who was always with or near Baal. And Ahab took up her worship. He also pursued it. He promoted it in Israel. And that's why he became the worst king in the history of that people. Why then? Why then does God put this fulfillment of Joshua 6 verse 26 in the record of Ahab and Jezebel? Well, your answer is given in 1 Kings chapter 21. Should have come there. 1 Kings chapter 21. Verses 25 and 26. And this is where Elijah catches up with Ahab in the vineyard of Naboth. You know the story. Verse 25 of 1 Kings 21 says, But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of Yahweh, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. That word stirred, by the way, is the Hebrew word sooth. It means to trick, to stimulate. You know, she was always there behind him. She always had a, had a hat pin. You know, Ahab, here, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Trotting him the whole way. Stirring him up to do more and more to promote Baal worship in the land. Then it says this in verse 26, and he did very abominably in following idols. According to all things as did the Amorites. Where were they based in the land? Well, Jericho was one of their headquarters. As the Amorites, whom Yahweh cast out before the children of of Israel, and he started with Jericho. He devoted that to destruction. But it didn't stay that way because there was a man, a foolish man, called Hiel. His name means living of God. He was about to die at the hand of God. He lost his firstborn son, Abiram, father of height, because he laid the foundations of Jericho. You know what that prophecy of Joshua 6, verse 26, was actually saying? We don't know how many children this man had. He might have a dozen. Every single one of them died. From the oldest, when he laid the foundations, to the next one in the next stage of the project, to the next one in the next stage of the project, and the last thing you did when you built a city was to put the gates up. And when he put the gates up, his youngest son died. His whole family was wiped out. They were devoted to destruction. That was God's curse on the man that would rebuild Jericho. Because to rebuild that city indicated bringing back the worship that he had condemned 
in the days <coughs> of Joshua. Baal worship. That's what was brought back into the land of Israel. So he loses Sega a lot. Look at the names he gives his children. This man is pretentious, isn't he? You know, father of height buries him. There might have been a dozen others. We don't know. Sega, the youngest. He means aloft, from inaccessible, the root. He dies. He buries him. He doesn't have any family to perpetuate Jericho in his name. That's God's condemnation. And that's why verse 34 is in 1 Kings chapter 16. Because Ahab was the restorer of Baal worship. And it just so happens, brethren and sisters, that in the beautiful scheme of the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, particularly the second advent of our Lord Jesus Christ that runs right through the book of Joshua, up at least to, the, to chapter 12, in that scheme of things, Joshua chapter 6 is the Armageddon chapter. And we're going to find ourselves back at Armageddon a little later on in our study. So what survived Jericho? Some gold, which is now worth about $1,200 an ounce. Yes. But most importantly, what survived Jericho was a Babylonian priestly garment of one of Semiramis's priests. That's what survived. And that's what's going to survive Armageddon, isn't it? Armageddon will smash the cities of the world. It will break the infrastructure of mankind. It will be the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. But it will not destroy one thing. It will not destroy Babylon, the great. That will remain. It will survive Armageddon. It will have to be destroyed in the following 40 years. So this is the pattern of things you see. When you look back and you see what God is doing. So let's come back to 1 Kings 16 and 17. And just follow this story through. We've seen in this family line of Omri, who begins a new dynasty. He's the statue maker. Ahab is the rebuilder of Baal worship, the founder of an apostate church in Israel. We've talked about Jezebel, the mother of harlots, and a teacher of Baal worship. That's what Christ says she was doing in Thyatira. So here she is. The apostasy in the times of John is springing up out of the ecclesia as it sprang up when Ahab brought Jezebel into the ecclesia in ancient times. But of course, Jezebel had a daughter. They had a daughter, Ahab and Jezebel, didn't they? And her name was Athaliah. Now, she was a wonderful grandmother. She went around on the death of her son Ahaziah, cutting the throats of all her grandchildren. She's the absolute antithesis of my wife. It won't uh, go anywhere because the grandchildren are at home. Absolute <coughs> antithesis. She cuts the throat of all of her grandchildren, except for one that God preserves. And the house of David survives by the thread of the life of a six-month-old baby. That's how close God's promises got to being debunked by the work of the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. I want to show you the pattern. You come to 2 Chronicles chapter 22. 2 Chronicles 22, verses 2 to 4. You recall that formula from Micah chapter 6, verse 16? It's probably an idea to have it written somewhere in 1 Kings 16. And I also write it here in the record of 2 Chronicles chapter 22. Do you remember? The statutes of Omri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab. Have a look here, verse 2. When it says here in verse 2, 40 and 2 years old was Ahaziah, I should read 20 and 2 years old. You can make that correction. It's correct. He was 22 years of age. He could not have been 42 because we can work the, the numbers of the kings out to a certain degree. He was 22 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Athaliah, the da daughter of... Who? You see what it says? The daughter of Omri. She wasn't the daughter of Omri. She was the daughter of Ahab. And Jezebel. So why is Omri put there? Why does the grandfather take pride of place? Got to be a reason. And there is. Just read on. I'm going to say this. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counsellor to do wickedly. 
Wherefore he did evil in the sight of Yahweh, like the house of Ahab. For they were his counsellors after the death of his father to his destruction. So there's the formula. The statutes of Omri are kept. And all the works of the house of Ahab. So Athaliah was like Omri was to Ahab. She was the teacher, the counsellor for her son, Ahaziah. And he implemented her ideologies in Israel. Exactly the same formula. Where does that come from? Cush and Nimrod. As we're going to see in a moment, God willing. So what does God do about this? How does Yahweh respond to this challenge to the truth? Deadly challenge it is in that, in that time. Well, he responds by raising up two witnesses. Two witnesses. Just like it is in Revelation chapter 11. There is a political witness and there's a religious witness. So who do you think might be his religious witness? Well, it's Elijah the prophet. And Elijah sweeps in from Gilead. He's the messenger of the covenant, to use the words of Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. And a religious witness against the apostate church, there shall not be Jew nor reign. What do they represent? The word of God. There will not be Jew nor reign these years. But according to my word, he is God's religious witness against this Babylonian system that's been established now in Israel by Ahab and Jezebel. I'm going to take you in a moment to Revelation chapter 11. I'm going to have a look at this and we'll see that it's based upon this record here in 1 Kings 17 and 18. Who do you think might be the political witness? Well, what about Obadiah that we read of in 1 Kings chapter 18? You know the man that comes out and says to Elijah, he's the right hand man of Ahab. It is a faithful Christadelphian. He hates despises what Ahab and Jezebel stand for, but this is his job. He's the right-hand man. And Ahab says, look, we've got, we're desperate. We've got to find some grass for the horses, for the few remaining horses. This is after three and a half years of drought. And so he takes this man, Obadiah, whose name means the servant of Yahweh, and he takes him out to find some grass. And Obadiah encounters Elijah. And you know the story, don't you? Obadiah says, well, look, I can't go back to it because you'll disappear, Elijah. He says, no, 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 I'm going to meet him today. And this, the rest, of course, is history. So he is the political witness. He's in the government. He's like the prime minister, the right-hand man of Ahab. So you have a religious witness and you have a political witness. Exactly what happens in the history of our brotherhood persecuted by the Catholic system for 1260 days or 42 months or three and a half years. You come to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation 11 verse 2 says this. But the court with it, which is without the temple, leave out. Why? Because it's apostate. This is the apostasy of the brotherhood. Don't put the court in. It's Catholic. It goes on to say this. But it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city, that is the true ecclesia, in the minority now, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. That's a reference to the period of 608, 610, through to 1868, 1870, from the Fokin Decree to the time when the papacy lost its temporal power, when Garibaldi threw the Pope out of Rome. That's why, you see, there's a different time period in the next verse. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. It's precisely the same period in terms of time. You know, 42 months is 1260 days using the Jewish calendar. Exactly the same period of time but a different era of time. This period of a thousand uh, uh, 260 days is the period from the time when Constantine came to power in 312 AD 
when he defeated Maxentius at the Battle of Milvian Bridge with the support of the apostate Christian church. And from that day onwards, he gave them their reward. <coughs> and their reward was that he would support them against their enemies. Who was their enemies? Our brothers and sisters, whom they chased for the next 1260 years until 1572, and the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day destroyed 100,000 plus Huguenots in France. That's what happened. Persecution for 1260 years, or three and a half years, as it were. Read on. Verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Hmm, that's interesting. It's starting to use the language of Elijah, isn't it? And devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. What? In the days of their prophecy? How long have these witnesses prophesied? Well, for 1260 years. Or days. Three and a half years. The precise length of the drought in the days of Ahab. Accident, you think? Or is the scripture telling us that that record back there of Ahab and Jezebel and the ministry of Elijah and the work of Obadiah are a pattern for the apocalypse? Now, who were these two witnesses in history? Well, they were political and religious resistance to Rome. There were people in the ancient world when Rome was dominant who said, we're not going to have Rome to rule over us particularly when the Roman Catholic Church is in charge, no way in the world. So they opposed Rome, particularly in North Africa. Where did our brethren go to seek refuge? Oh, to North Africa. Because that's where they found some protection from the political witness. And there was a religious witness too. People who said, we don't like Rome's dogmas, we're not going to listen to that. So they resisted Rome. Now they didn't have the truth. But they were Protestants of the time, you might say. So where did our brethren find refuge? Well, they were tucked away amongst that group of opposition to Rome. And so God gave our brothers and sisters a breathing space. What did Abadiah do? He took a hundred prophets of Yahweh and he hid them in a cave, 50 by 50. What was Elijah supposed to do? Educate Yahweh's remnant in Israel in the matters of the truth. Where was he? Horeb. After the sign that was given from heaven. And he made a mistake. But he won't make it again, as you're going to see. Because what happened is a pattern of things to come. He won't make that mistake again. So you see where the apocalypse is drawing its language from? It's quite plain, isn't it? It's coming from the story of Ahab and Jezebel and the work of Elijah the prophet. I'm going to give you a rest. Not really, but I'm going to give you a bit of a rest from that kind of thing. Because from now on, I'm actually going to talk for the next 15 or 20 minutes or so about the origins. The origins of the Baal worship that found its way into Israel in the north in the times of Ahab and Jezebel and into Judah in the south in the times of Manasseh, son of Hezekiah. We're going to go back and we're going to explore the roots of Baal worship. So this is a bit more like a history lesson, but it's, it's essential to have this information if you're going to make the point I want to make at the end of this talk. So we go right back to the times of Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees. And here we are. That's, this is someone's depiction of Abraham. I'm not sure that he'd be pleased with it, but anyway. <laughs> and uh, Sarah is here, obviously, a very beautiful woman. I'm not sure she'd be wearing earrings like that. Anyway, she's got them on. And this is a ziggurat. Okay? That was how the Tower of Babel looked. Did you see the previous one? This one here. This is Peter Bruegel's fanciful concept of the Tower of Babel based upon the Colosseum. It looked nothing like that. The Tower of Babel was a ziggurat like that. We don't know how high it was, but it was something 
of that ilk. Huge because they said, said that they could get above the flood. Who was the builder of that? Well, the man who built that was Nimrod, who just happens to be the 13th generation from Adam. Again, purely by accident. The 13th generation from Adam. And 13 is the biblical number for rebellion. And Nimrod's name means the rebel or we will rebel. And that's what building of the Tower of Babel was all about. Who was his father? Well, his father was Cush, who was the counsellor of Nimrod. And history records that Cush, also called Kish, and Bel, ah, now we're getting a bit closer to Baal, aren't we? Bel, settled in Babylon first. Cush was the great original prophet of the Babylonian mysteries, and in the Bible, he's called Bel. Now again, I don't have time to take you to these passages, to Isaiah 46 verse 1. The Jeremiah chapter 50 verse 2. The Jeremiah 51 verse 44. But if you were to jot them down, you'll find that they speak of Bel. When you read that prophecy, it's about Cush, the great original prophet of the Babylonian mysteries. On the formula, the statutes of Cush are kept and all the works of the house of Nimrod. That's where it came from. Way back there in Genesis chapter 10 and 11. By the way, Bel means the confounder, which you'll see relates to Babel, Babylon. So we begin to see the origins of Babylon the Great. This is where it began. In the Chaldean, his name means to break in pieces or to scatter abroad, and that's what happened when Yahweh intervened and interrupted the work of the building of the Tower of Babel. You know what his symbol was, Bell? You find it in one of these prophecies here. It was a club. And with a club, you crash it down on something and break it into a thousand bits. You get the idea of scattering abroad. Bell was later called Baal and Janus. So when we read about Baal worship coming into Israel via Zidon, we are reading about the introduction of Cush and Nimrod into the ecclesia of God. I'm going to talk about Janus in a moment as well. It's not a female name, by the way. It's a, it's a name of a god. And we get our month January from that particular god. And we're in January now. So we're commemorating the god Janus as we live out this month of January, according to the current calendar that we're using. Now, Cush began the form of false religion that spread throughout Mesopotamia and Canaan on the principle of Micah 6 verse 16. He developed the statutes and Nimrod implemented them. And he implemented them very, very effectively. Now we read in Genesis chapter 10 verse 8 this phrase, Cush begat Nimrod. So he's the father, Nimrod is the son. And it just so happens that a similar phrase, it's not the same phrase that you find in the Hebrew of Genesis 10 verse 8, but a very similar phrase Nimrod ben Cush has a numerical value of 666. Nimrod has a numerical value of 294, Ben of 52, and Cush of 320, <coughs> for a total of 666. And I don't need to remind you of Revelation 13, verse 18, that the number of the papal man is 666. Six, six. Nimrod's name, as I said, means the rebel or we will rebel, the 13th generation from Adam. We know from Genesis 14, verse 4, 17, 25, and many other places that 13 is the number of rebellion. He was the first God king or God of the earth. You know, Revelation chapter 11, verse 4, we didn't read that verse. It talks about these witnesses prophesying before the God of the earth. This is not before the God of heaven, Yahweh, but the God of the earth. So who are they prophesying against? Well, the Pope. The Pope, who's the God of the earth. He still thinks he's the God of the earth today. He founded the first kingdom on earth, did Nimrod, the kingdom of men, which Christ is about to come and overthrow. And he's called a mighty hunter, a Gibor Sayyid, in the record of Genesis chapter 10. It means a hero of the chase. And this is very important in the establishing of his power. I want you to come back to Genesis chapter 9. So what did Nimrod do to acquire power 
Why did he become a god in the eyes of his people? Why did he have the capacity to develop a kingdom, the kingdom of men? Well, because he usurped God's dominion over the carnal creation. By being a mighty hunter. I want to show you how. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 2. We might just read verse 1 for the connection. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. What's God saying to Noah? Well, he's cleaned up the earth, hasn't he? He's got rid of two billion people. There's now only eight people left. They're all Christadelphians. Carnality is not ruling in the earth anymore. By the way, what did Adam lose when he sinned? His dominion, didn't he? His dominion over carnal things. He lost that. So now God, 1656 years later, cleans the earth up. They come out of the ark and he says, I'm going to give you some of your dominion back. And the animals, even the wild ones, they'll fear you. How long will that last? Until sin re-emerges and apostasy develops in the ecclesia and God takes it away. Do you want proof of this? Do you want proof that this actually happens? 2 Kings chapter 17. You can go there in your own time. I'll tell you what it says. That when the Assyrians came in 722 BC and they took all of the last remaining 28,000 people out of the land of Israel and cut them off into all parts of the north and they brought five other peoples and they plonked them in the land. What happened to those people when they came to the land? They worshipped their own gods, didn't they? And so the wild beasts rose up against them. Who created that? Who did that? Well, Yahweh. So they said, oh, we're going to find out about their religion of this land. We're going to find something about the God of this land. So they went and got priests of Jeroboam that good that was. But at least they turned their attention to Yahweh and say that wild beasts backed off. Get the point? Yahweh uses the wild beasts against men who rebel against him, who do not recognise him. So what happened here in Genesis 9 verse 2 is that he gave the family of Noah a measure of dominion over the animals. The animals would be tame. They would actually fear. They would run away from Noah and his sons and his grandchildren while they kept the faith. A hundred years after the flood, Nimrod was in full flight and he was building the Tower of Babel. How come? How come he got that power? Well, you see, when sin re-entered the scene and God withdrew that partial dominion from them, the wild beasts arose against them. Who's going to protect them? A mighty hunter who flies in the face of Yahweh. And that's what Genesis 10 verse 8 means. He flies in the face of Yahweh. He becomes a usurper of God's dominion. He says to his people, I can kill animals. I'm not afraid of lions and tigers. I can kill them. And so his people said, you're our protector. He builds two mega cities with huge walls to keep the animals out. And so the kingdom of men comes into existence. So they worship him as a god. Anyone been to the British Museum in London? Oh, we've got a, we've got a Londonite. Well, we've got, a, we've got an English brother here. He would have been to the British Museum. You've been to the Assyrian section? What are the walls like? Full of the wallpaper. It's actually stone wallpaper from the palaces of the Assyrian kings. It's all over that section. You know what every single one of those things depicts? Assyrian kings shooting lions. <coughs> lions spread eagle, arrows sticking out of them. What's that all about? Well, where did these Assyrian kings come from? From Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Yahweh, flying in the face. That's how they got their power. That's why men worshipped them, because they could, could, could control and suppress the wild beasts that made life so difficult for their people. So God's dominion was usurped 
by Nimrod, who's the first pope. And I think there's another man who's sitting in a place in Rome today who has usurped God's dominion. You know him too? His name is Benedict the 16th. That's where he came from. He's the first pope, right back there at the beginning, 100 years after the flood. So he established a name of blasphemy. Let us build a tower, they said. Let us make us a name. It's exactly what the papacy has done. Because this is its roots. This is where it came from. So what is that name of blasphemy today? Well, it's the name of Nimrod. It's the title that Nimrod bore. Pontifex Maximus. You've heard of him before, haven't you? Constantine was a Pontifex Maximus. And the Pope today is a Pontiff, isn't he? It's just an abbreviation of Pontifex Maximus. Anyone been to the Vatican? If you go to the Vatican, you'll get sick and tired of seeing PM. That doesn't mean Prime Minister. All right? Everywhere. I went into the roof, 656 steps. I was hoping it was 666. <laughs> to the roof. And you go up through the net, you've got to be thin. Get up there at the top, you get out, you look. Beautiful view of the Tiber and of all of the papal grounds. I'll show, them, show those to you in a minute. And you look around and there's always little air things that are coming out of the roof of the Vatican. And every single one of them has got a name of the Pope on it. Starting with P.M. Pontifex, Maximus, whatever his name was. It's everywhere. This is on the floor. Did you notice it? Not, not a bad floor, actually, is it? See, this pont... Pont, Max, Pontifex, Maximus. It's the title of Nimrod. So where do we get Pontiff from? The Pope is acknowledged as the Pontifex Maximus of the Roman Church. The title of pagan Roman Empress, who were the official high priests of their pagan religion and of their mysteries, was Pontifex Maximus. The title goes right back to Nimrod. And the Supreme Pontiff of Paganism bore the Chaldean title, Peter. Little wonder they chose Peter as their first Pope. You know that? It's called Peter in Chaldean. He was the interpreter of the mysteries. So the office of Pontifex Maximus, or Chief Priest, was to declare and interpret the divine law and preside over the sacred rites. Whose law is he interpreting? Divine law? Whose principles is he pushing? Whose statutes do you think he's teaching? Not Yahweh's. The statutes of Cush. That's where they came from. And every single doctrine of the churches that is not in accordance with the truth in one form or another can be traced right back to the days of Cush. He's the inventor of all of, the, all of those doctrines that we know have apostatised the religious community today. Whether it be Christian or Buddhist, or Hindu, or whatever it might be. They all come from the time of Nimrod. I'm going to read two Babylons to find that out. So what about this Janus? The Roman version of Nimrod. Well, he was the god of doors and of gateways. That's why we have janitors. You know, after we finish this meeting tonight, there was a fellow coming in here to clean up. What do they call him? He's a janitor. Why? Because he gets his name from Janus the pagan god of Rome. It came from Nimrod, okay? Cush and Nimrod. Hence, as I said, we get our month January. I just happened to be born in January, but I'm hoping I've got no relationship to Janus at all. Now, his temple, the temples of Janus, faced east and west for the beginning and the ending of the day. You know, we just had Christmas. The summer, or winter solstice here, and there's the summer solstice, okay? Where the sun, the old sun dies and the new sun is born. That all comes from Nimrod and from his son, Tammuz. So this statue that you're going to see in a moment was placed in this temple of Janus that faced east and west. This statue with its two faces were gazing in those two directions, east and west. One, one face was young, the other was old. The older face was that of Nimrod, and the younger face was his reincarnation in Tamos. 
His symbols were a key and a cock, a rooster. Mm, like the papal ones. And the cardinals of today, from the Latin cardo, which means hinges, are based on the practices of this god, Janus, the god of doors and gateways. You know where they came from, cardinals? You know why they wear red? And the ordinary Catholic priests wear black? You know that? Well, these were Semiramis' priests. And her upper echelon, her inner circle, like the 400 prophets of Jezebel later on, wore red gum. They had access to the inner sanctum of Semiramis and Nimrod. It's the cardinals who go into the inner sanctum to elect the next pope. And you get white or black smoke. Okay? Their name comes from this god, Janus, the god of doors and gateways. Now, if you take a Google Earth shot of Rome, this is what you see. But there's something wrong with it. Anybody see what's wrong with it? The directions are not right. Now, those are really good eyes. If you look down here, you can see what direction it is. That's north, down that way. So which way is the Vatican facing? I wonder who was the architect who set out this design of the Vatican? Well, he knew what he was doing because he's building a temple of Janus. And the temples of Janus always faced east, with the back facing west. And that's exactly what happens here. That's the east. And I can tell you, I walked along that street towards the Tiber at 11 o'clock in the morning on a summer day in Rome. And I nearly roasted. The sun was beaming straight down that street and it was something like 37, 38 degrees centigrade. Felt like jumping in the tiger. So it faces east with the back facing west. Okay? You notice it's like the shape of a key? You notice that? What were Genesis symbols? A key and a cock. And there he is. He's got the key in his hand, you see? And you see the key? That's the handle of the key there. This is the part that opens the door, opens the lock, see? So when they designed the Vatican, they designed it in the shape of the key of Janus. Oh, of course you would. This is not willy-nilly. They know what they're doing, even if we don't. They know what they're doing. And when you walk in the door, this is my photograph, by the way, I had to take this shot because every time I walked in a door, there were two keys there in the marble. Because you see, they think they have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. When I climbed to the top, right up here, you see this little darkish spot on the roof of the, of the Vatican? You can go right up there and there's this little area you can sort of squeeze in there with a thousand other people and you can look down over the grounds of the Vatican, okay? I looked over the back. Guess what I see over here in the gardens? I mean, it's summer. The flowers are in bloom. Yeah, a garden bed in the shape of two keys. So it doesn't matter where you look. They're telling you they have the keys of the kingdom of heaven. This is the temple of Janus. So where does it come from? It comes from way back here. From the times of the Tower of Babel. The beginning of his kingdom, it says in Genesis 10 verse 10, the kingdom of Nimrod was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. I'll tell you something about Shinar in a minute. And what Nimrod did in Genesis 10, and I think most of us are still back there, if you have a look at Genesis 10, he built two mega cities. These mega cities consisted of four towns that he joined together with a wall. Well, why put a wall between them? Well, because he wanted to protect his people from the wild animals. He was the one who now dominated the animals. He was a mighty hunter in the face of Yahweh. This is how he kept men worshipping him. They made him a god king because of this. Do you know that the, when Jonah went to the city of Nineveh, it was a city of how many days journey? Three days journey? That's 60 miles or 100 kilometres for the younger ones amongst us. Hey, a city of 100 kilometres? You got one in like that? No. But if you joined, if you were to join, how far is Saskatoon away? 100k? I don't know. 
But if you joined Saskatoon and North Battleford with a wall and then picked another town somewhere out, another, you know, 100 k's away, and joined that one with a wall and brought it right around, four square, you have a city of three days journey. Okay? That's what it means in Jonah. So he built mega cities like that to protect his people so they could keep his godship and his kingdom, which he had established. Now we're told what these were, there was Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Cana. You see I've highlighted Erech, I'll say a bit more about that in a second. And Nineveh, Rehoboth, Calah, and Reza. But I just want you to come and have a look at Genesis 10 and verse 11. Because this is sometimes misunderstood. Verse 11 of Genesis 10 says this, Out of that land went forth Asher, and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth and Calah, and reason between Nineveh and Calah, the same is a great city, because it had the walls joining these four towns. Now, who's the builder of this second set of mega cities? Well, it's Nimrod. The translation there of the AV is not very good. The margin is better. When it says, out of that land that is out of Babylon, Shinar, he went forth into Assyria. And it's, of course, where Nineveh is built, isn't it? In the land of Assyria. So it's Nimrod who goes forth and builds in the land of Assyria this second set of four cities joined together. So then, the, the earliest Babylonian kings bore the title Four Races. See? That was one of the titles given to them. And so when God decided that he would call Abram from the heart of Nimrudian apostasy, what did he do? He called him to begin the process of unwinding the rebellion of Nimrod and to take his dominion back. That's why God called Abraham. That's why the record of Genesis 11 and 12 is so close to Genesis 10. And when he called him, he developed from him Israel. And the nation of Israel was marked by four. Four mothers for the twelve sons of Jacob. The four square encampment. The four standards of Israel. The perfect, cute, most holy place. You can go on and on. Why did God do that? Well, he's going to unwind what Nimrod did. He's going to start with one man. He says that in Isaiah 51 verse 1. I called him alone. He started with one man. And ultimately, by the time I'm finished, it will take me 7,000 years, I will undo everything that Nimrod has done and I will destroy the kingdom of men. That's what God said. So you see, there's a pattern in all of this. <clears throat> so one of the cities that he built was this city, Erech. And a commentary on this matter by Bryce Self says this, it was in Mesopotamia that the first cities were built after the flood and the first of these was quite naturally named after the very first city built by man before the flood, the city that Esau built, called Enoch, after the name of his son. Due to vagaries of linguistic permutation, this name has come down to us as Erech or Uruk in the Sumerian language, not Sanarian language, Sumerian. Okay? So when Nimrod establishes one of these towns, he's rebuilding a relic. You know, they're not unknown for relics, are they? This Babylonian people. He rebuilds a relic, the city that, that Esau, uh, sorry, Esau, that Cain had built previously, prior to the, front, the flood. Okay, so let's bring this down to our time. What are the European nations doing today? Well, they're rebuilding the Tower of Babel, aren't they? Well, they think they are. You've all seen this poster, haven't you? This poster of using Peter Bruegel's painting of the Tower of Babel. Many tongues, one voice. That's what they think Europe is. Spitting in the face of God because he came down with his angels and he confused their tongues and said, that will stop you. They're now saying, you ain't going to stop us. Europe, many tongues, I don't care about the language problem. One voice. Genesis 11 verse 1 says they all have one lip. One lip. One voice. And God confused their language. 
So when they designed the new white elephant in Strasbourg, which is used once a month or once every six weeks, and it cost them, cost them squillions to get the people from Brussels to here for a couple of sessions in this brand spanking new parliamentary building for the EU. What design did they use? You can see, can't you? There's Bruegel's painting of the Tower of Babel, and that's why they've left this stuff on the top. Not unfinished. This is a finished building. It's designed on the Tower of Babel. So when the European nations convene there, talk about the uniting of Europe, many times, one voice, they meet in the building that is based on the Tower of Babel. Is that all they've done? No. You see, in the early 1990s, they had towering ambitions, as this newspaper article said. You see this building here, this is the Berlaymont building. Now this is the headquarters, was the headquarters, still is effectively the headquarters of the European Union. You notice it's in the shape of a cross. That's no mistake. You'll also notice it's a crooked cross, which is very appropriate. This is the building in the shape of a cross, because the Catholic Church underwrote <coughs> the EEC, as it was once known. The common market, as it was known before that. In 1956, when six nations met in Rome to form the common market. They eventually built this building in the shape of a cross for that reason. They had designs. See, that's the building on building there. That's the one that you see there. This little one down here. They had designs of building a tower one kilometre high. And you'll be able to see things 120 kilometres away from the top of that tower. You know, it never got built because it would have cost <coughs> literally squillions. And they didn't have it. But that was their ambition. So you see, we're actually watching the rebuilding of the Tower of Babel. The refurbishing of the Kingdom of Men. And at the head of that very shortly will be Nimrod. Oh, he might be called Benedict the Sixteenth, Or John the Twenty-Fourth. Or John Paul the Third. We don't know. He might even be a black man. Because the first Pope was a black man. Nimrod. We don't know. But we're watching the rebuilding of it. Guess who's going to destroy it? Elijah, with you and me, and Israel returning to the land. Just like we considered the other night, that's going to destroy it. So this is very relevant, isn't it? From what we're about to see happen in the earth. So there's our building based on the Tower of Babel. That's the best they can do. Couldn't build this one? Satisfied with that one. And this is the system behind it all. Great Babylon. With this woman sitting aside a scarlet coloured beast in Revelation chapter 17, verses 1 to 3. She's in a wilderness, the wilderness of the peoples, the waters which thou sawest, where the horse is, are peoples, and multitudes, and nations, and tongues. And it's through that wilderness that Elijah is down to bring. All the Jews from every nation on earth. And they're going to bring judgment upon that system, upon Babylon the Great. And Nimrod is going to breathe his last breath. At the end of that 40 years, Cush is not going to have any more statues being pumped around by any of his sons. Do you know that Semiramis means the gift of the sea? You know who this woman is actually based upon? The wife of Nimrod. Her name, Semiramis, means the gift of the sea. People think that it was Nebuchadnezzar who built one of the wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens. Forget it. He just refurbished it for his Persian wife. It was Semiramis who built that. She built the hanging gardens. And Semiramis has a name that's very significant in the Bible. If you don't read her name in the Bible, do you? In that form. You won't find the word Semiramis. Look it up in the, in the list of music. There's an <coughs> opera written called Semiramis. But you don't read it in the Bible. But you do. Because Semiramis is the Hellenized, that is the Greekized form of the Arcadian name, Semirat. 
or gift of the sea. That's what it means. <coughs> a woman was sitting astride of these on many waters, thinking she's the gift of the sea. When you translate this word, Samur, which is the beginning of this name, into Hebrew, it becomes Shina, the biblical name for Lower Mesopotamia. So when Nimrod gathered his company to rebel against Yahweh and to fly in the face of God, where'd you go? To the land of his wife, Semiramis, the land of Shina. That's where he went. And that's where that town... Where did the two women go? Samaria and Jerusalem with an ephah. Up to the land of Samaritans. And she's there in Revelation 17. Sitting astride a colored beast on many waters. Because she's the gift of the sea, of course. Now legend has it that she was raised by doves. The symbol of peace and rest. It's a hint to know, isn't it? And when you look at the seal of Samaritan, this is her ancient seal. There she is. Wonderful woman. Looks like a Catholic nun to me. I wonder where they got that card from. There's doves up here, see? But on the obverse side of this metal, here's a dove with an olive branch in its mouth. I wonder where that came from. That's Genesis chapter 8, isn't it? Of course it is. Because they're counterfeits. That system is a counterfeit. It's borrowed from the truth. It's stolen in our names. That's what it's done. It's the Antichrist instead of Christ. It comes right back to Nimrod and his wife, Semiramis. Now she looks something like this. This is not actually a picture of Semiramis. There is one. You see that statue of Nimrod? That's the only visage of Nimrod in ex that's extant. The one we saw earlier on. This is Queen Shubat of Earth. She only wore fangle jangles. She's sinking in the snow. She's overweight with fangle jangles. But she would have looked something like that. You know? What did Jezebel do when Jehu arrived on the scene? She painted her eyes, it says. The word aims there. It just painted her face. All right, that means she painted her eyes. So she got out that stuff, you know? <laughs> you know the sort of thing they do? To dress herself up, she couldn't resist <coughs> it. She was trying to actually seduce Jehu. But being the kind of woman she was, she just couldn't hold her anger in. We're going to see where Jehu comes into the story shortly. And she built, along with Nimrod, Babylon. Now one of the main features of Babylon is the processional way. Now go through the, the, the Ishtar <coughs> Gate. You can go to Berlin today and you can see the Ishtar Gate in all its glory. What was it about? Well Ishtar is Astart. We get our Easter from that. Okay? Easter comes from Astar or Ishtar. Why was it important? Well, this is the gate through which the kings, the surrounding kings, came for her orgies. One of the ways she, she dominated the kings around her was to say, you'll come up when I specify. And all like, these kings came up and she would put on orgies in which she would commit fornication with all of those kings. Do I hear echoes here? In Revelation chapter 18, the system with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. Where'd that come from? Semiramis. Okay? She was the first mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So that's why you've got this imagery in the Apocalypse. The woman, the harlot woman, mystery, battle on the ground, mother of harlots. Abominations of the earth, sitting astride the scarlet coloured beast with its seven horns, seven heads and ten horns, I should say. And we're about to destroy it. Should you come to Revelation 16? I'm nearly done, and looking at the clock, I need to be nearly done. Just give me a short while. If you want to go home, you can go home now. I'm going to go on another ten minutes. 
We need to finish the story. Revelation 16, verses 18 to 20. Verse 17 is the pouring out of the seventh vial of the wrath of God. It's poured out upon Babylon the Great in verse 19, which is likened to a great mountain, which is destroyed. It becomes like Jeremiah 51, which is where the language is being drawn from. Jeremiah 51. It's a burning mountain. It's the mountain of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 7, which stands before Zerubbabel, Christ as king. It's got to destroy it. It's got to be removed. It's the Mount of Esau of Ob Obadiah, verse 21. When saviors come up upon Mount Zion and destroy the mount, the government of Esau, the same mountain. It's the system of Babylon the Great. So how is it destroyed? Have a look here at verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the fierceness of the cup of, of his wrath. This is a probable reference to the three mouths of verse 13 of Revelation chapter 16. Because the three unclean spirits like frogs that are doing so much damage to our brotherhood today, incredible damage, came out of three mouths. The mouth of the dragon, the mouth of the beast and the mouth, mouth of the false prophet. And this infers the order in which they will be destroyed. The dragons first. That's the power in control of Constantinople and Russia will become that power very shortly. When they come down upon the land, they're destroyed in the land of Israel. They're the first to go. The second is the beast. It's a reference to the European nations who are reforming, redeveloping the Holy Roman Empire, rebuilding the Tower of Babel. They will be subdued over a period of 40 years after the conflict of Armageddon. And the false prophet is the papacy, the last enemy to be destroyed before the kingdoms can be fully established. So this system is going to survive for 40 years after Armageddon, but it's going to go down because in it is the blood of prophets and of our brothers and sisters who suffered massively at her hands. You've seen this chart, haven't you? We well, can divide this up into three parts. This is the harvest of the earth. Okay? Um, again, short, brief, but catastrophic. Has a massive impact upon Catholicism. But they rebuild. So you have to have what is described in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7 as the hour of judgment. That hour of judgment is also called in Revelation 14 and 19 the vintage of the earth, the pressing out of the wine press of the wrath of God. That's the second stage. And then you have the destruction of the papacy. Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. The beast and the false prophet, the last enemy to be destroyed before Christ, has total control in the earth. So does that come from the Old Testament? Yes, it does. We've got the history now. We know the history, don't we? And you can see that pattern back here in the work of Elijah the prophet and those who succeeded him. Here's Ahab. And when... He and his prophets were called to Mount Carmel. What did Elijah do? He gave a sign from heaven. And Christ says, Armageddon is the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Fire will come down from heaven. And fire came down from heaven. It's typical of Armageddon. But what happened then? Well, Jehu comes on the scene. And he kills Jehu some time later, doesn't he? Just like Rome, it's going to go down the gurgler. Revelation 14 and verse 8. Ten years. <coughs> what does he do then? What does Jehu do then? Well, he gathers all the Baal worshippers. But not before he annihilates the house of Ahab. So he annihilates the house of Ahab over 30 years, as it were. That's that period where Babylon the Great is destroyed in the hour of divine judgment of 30 years. What happens last? Every single Baal worshipper in Israel is annihilated. <coughs> They're all gathered into that massive building, remember? And he says to the 80 men on the doors, don't you let one go, or you lose your life. I know what I'd be doing. And every single one of them, ardent Catholics and the false prophet himself, are finally destroyed. So when you look at what happened in history, Elijah and Jehu was anointed by Elisha, you see that pattern. But that's not the end of the story. You know this story as well as I do, so I don't even need to turn it. You can turn it up. If you want. 1 Kings 19. 
But I'll tell you the story. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Elijah flees from Jezebel. He goes to Mount Horeb to plead against Israel and God says, what are you doing down here? So he gives him three signs. Stand out on the lip of the cave, Elijah, on Mount Horeb, while I pass by. And wind, earthquake, and fire pass by. And finally, when all the noise has subsided, Elijah, who's now in the back of the cave because he's retreated in fear, <coughs> hears the voice of a gentle whisper and he re-emerges. What does God tell him to do then? He says, you go back. I want you to do three things, Elijah. I want you to anoint Hazael, king of Syria. He doesn't do it. Elisha does. You know what Hazael means? God has seen. Then I want you to anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. He doesn't do it. Elisha does it. And Jehu's name means Yah is he. I want you to anoint Elisha, Elisha, prophet in your room. That's the only thing Elijah does that he's told to do. And Elisha is called, we know his name means the salvation of Yahweh. Elisha is called the son of Shaphat. His first work is a work of judgment. 42 blasphemous youths come out. They criticise. They say, go up thou bald head. What are they saying? Are they, are they criticising a man who's bald? Yeah, but not really. What they're saying to him, why don't you go like Elijah? He was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. Come on, go up. Do your flying trick, Elijah, and we'll believe you. And for that, 42 of them died at the hands of the, of the she bears came out and ripped them to shreds. So his first work was a work of judgment. But then he became God's still small voice in Israel and went around teaching the voice of the gentle whisper to those who would listen in Israel. And we read in Revelation 19 that Christ goes forth on a white horse and he's not alone. See these in the background? There are others who follow him on white horses and we know who they are because they're dressed in linen, clean and white, which is the righteousness of the saints. That's you and me. White horse. Because we're going to trample Jezebel. And how did she die? Jehu comes in with his chariots into Jezreel and he says, who's on my side? A couple of eunuchs look out. <laughs> Throw her down! And they grab hold of this woman. Now you think she would have said to her, just make sure you get me under the arms so that I go down neatly. <laughs> All right? Did you reckon she said that? She was scratching at their faces. She was scrabbling and hanging on. And they had to grab her and manhandle her and get her up to the windowsill and push her out. You know what it says? That when she went down, there was blood on the walls. Where'd that come from? She was thrashing as she went down. And as she went down, her arms were hitting the wall, leaving blood behind the wall. Did it kill her? No. She's too tough for that. It's only two stories anyway. <laughs> what killed her? The hooves of Jehu's chariot and horses. And they trampled under the hooves of horses. Exactly how the system of Babylon the Great will be destroyed on your horse and your horse and my horse, as it were. You know the horses? Israel. Being brought back to the land. Isaiah 63, verse 13. Got to be quick. Here they are Hazael, Jehu, and Elisha. How did they count about? Mm -hmm. Dragon judge, go destroyed in the land. Beast judged, earthquake. The political earthquake that Jehu brought to Israel. You know what it says in Revelation 16 verse 18? And there was a great earthquake. Not literal earthquake, that's quite a bit before Zechariah 14. This is a political, it's the third and last earthquake of the apocalypse. Political earthquake. And 
Babylon the Great comes in remembrance. Jehu brought a political earthquake to Israel. And the false prophet destroyed by he who is the salvation of Yahweh and who will become God's voice in the earth to everyone that is left of the nations. And he shall come down like rain upon the mowing grass and he shall speak peace unto the nations. And his dominion, Nimrod's lost his, his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth.